So thank you so much for joining me today. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Now, the topic of conversation today is all about trying to demystify some of the business intelligence buzzwords that you will hear about again and again and again. It's unfortunately the case that our industry is riddled with buzzwords. And you might think to yourself, well, isn't that how we sort of make money in the industry? Well, the thing is, it can actually be a way that people are get involved in gatekeeping in the industry. They use buzzwords and it means that people feel excluded and that's not a great place to be. So this is me, um, probably looking 10 years older right now, but um, I'm a number one best-selling Amazon author in organisational change. I'm so glad to get that orange uh, badge uh, next to the book that I helped to co-author. I have been coding for 40 years this year. I learned to code uh, when I was about eight or nine. So I've um, got a birthday coming up. So I just realized that, so that's four decades of coding. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> but that's, that's where we are. So I've been in the IT industry for 25 years. So a quarter of a century now. So uh, that's enough about me. So, I wanted to explain a little bit about the purpose of this particular presentation. So why? Why is it relevant? Or is it even relevant at all? Well, the thing is, I think it's all about helping businesses to do better with their data. When I speak to business leaders, one thing that I hear a lot is that people feel that the vendors are talking about all sorts of things, about their interpretation of what the data architectures look like, and it becomes very confusing for the customers. One major FTSE 100 organization I was working with, I was implementing and designing a data strategy. They had a vendor come and see them, and the, the customer presented their problems, and the vendor said, you need to do things in this particular way, and proposed a solution. So a month later, the customer went back to the vendor and said, we'd like to discuss our problems. And they met with a different team within the, the same vendor. And the other team gave them a completely different answer to the same questions. So what happens is, is with some vendors is they're all about selling you or pushing at you whatever they're selling at that particular moment. If they are wanting a particular technology and that's where the push is for sales, they're going to push you down that line. So it's very hard to get a quite independent view of what these concepts actually are. So for business decision makers, this is, this is actually really important. Now, for a huge organisation, the benefits may be seem obvious. They've got more money to spend. But what about smaller businesses? Are there any opportunities for them? Well, the thing is, there's plenty of opportunities for any organisation that has data. Even the smallest organisation will have data. And we know that AI is already going to play a major role in economy and also in society. In fact, you probably have some AI in your phone right now. So you're not very far from a piece of AI during your daily life. You may even take your phone with you to bed and leave it next to your bed at night. So you are really surrounded physically by AI. So when we look at AI, we're really saying that AI is future, which is fine. But what does it actually mean for organisations? What's kind of the point? The thing is, for many organisations, they will be thinking about what they can do with their data. A lot of organisations don't really understand where the data is coming from. So basically, every organisation has got data and information that comes from a variety of sources. That can be the Google Analytics, for example, on your website. could be your CRM system, your email. I'm sure everyone has too much of that social media conversations that you have with organizations and people. And then we've also got the Internet of Things. You may also be retrieving data from devices and sensors as well. And this is a very popular way in which people are starting to collect data now. When the people started to use the cloud, they tended to see the cloud as a major way of storing data. It could be used for backups. And it could also be used for a resiliency and it could be used where people could archive data. So essentially, people saw it as basically a major USB stick that 
organizations such as Microsoft, AWS, and Google actually use to store data. But now we're seeing that more and more cloud services are starting to appear to help organizations do more with their data. So even if you have data coming from devices, you can use that data and make more of it using some of these cloud services. So from the business perspective, what does it actually mean uh, to start thinking about your data? Let's take the case where an organization is at the very start of their journey and deciding to want to get to a state of maturity with their data. So you may envisage a small young startup getting to grips with their data as they start to mature. But in my experience, large organizations often want to take this journey as well. They often have heritage systems, legacy systems, which are storing lots of data. So they have an added issue where they are not starting from scratch, but they are inheriting problems which have already taken place and need to be solved. So I thought I'd put together a bit of a SWOT analysis to see what does understanding data actually mean for the business and use that as a context of trying to demystify some of the buzzwords that you see. So what are the strengths of database systems? Well, if you are serious about looking at your competitors as a business, then you will want to understand what data they are collecting and how they compare against you. So you can do that by looking at your data, for example. You can also use that as a way of innovating in the organization and trying to think of insights that you could get from the data. But it's very difficult to start to produce return on investments from analytics programs. Sometimes you can do that in terms of increasing productivity or reducing a cost somewhere. One great strength of database systems is if it's well organized, it can save time. One of the most time consuming things that people do in the workplace is they actually searching for data or information that they don't have and they can't find it properly. So we're trying to think about making systems more human centered and friendly so that the organization can make the data as accessible as possible. The idea being people are going after some mythical data dividend. The data dividend really means what value and can you make from your data? That can be things like reducing costs. It could be about optimizing productivity and um, optimizing business decision making from an operational or more strategic level. So I think one of the big questions I always get at least once a week is how do I get value from the data? So I want to start by demystifying that word value because I often ask people, what do you mean by value? What does value mean, like, mean to you and your organization? And often I don't get a good answer. And equally often, I also get different answers from same people in the same organization. So one of the key things that you hear a lot is data-driven value. How do I derive value from my data? To mystify that, what does value mean to you? That's an easy one. You can turn that around to the organization. What's not so easy is getting people to agree with one another. Because when we put humans together, we know that in businesses, they don't always agree and can always agree on a vision. And sometimes implementing technology can really mean that people get very very stuck in the details and sometimes people get very derailed by thinking about which technology to use. So they end up in an analysis paralysis. Someone invited me for a virtual coffee the other day and all they wanted to do actually, they dangled the opportunity of some work, like work in front of me. And then they said, I want to know what's better, Snowflake or, or Azure Synapse Analytics. So sometimes you have to be very careful about these very high level questions because you have to discern exactly what value looks like and what's most important to the customer in terms of priorities, because people don't prioritize. What they do, as they say, is everything is a high priority, which really means that nothing is. So we can start to look at different ways that we can think about these systems. So when we inherit large systems, we usually end up with a large, large amount of data. And in terms of doing things with that data, it can be computationally quite expensive. We might end up building really complex models. Those can take a long time to train if we're using artificial intelligence, for example. So what we're trying to do is build systems 
which are, are make, which are effective and efficient, but also give people what they need as well. And we're trying to reduce the amount of technical debt that we have in systems too. When I talk about technical debt, that's really the suboptimal, the sum of all the suboptimal decisions that the organisation has made over a period of time. Uh, I spoke to one organisation and asked them about their technical debt. And they said if they stopped work right now, just to fix all the technical debt issues, they wouldn't be able to start any new projects for another 10 years. Now that probably sounds a bit facetious, but actually uh, when I stayed on site for a little while, I actually think we had uh, quite a fair point. So we're trying to understand that sometimes the weaknesses are not is not the technology. Sometimes the weakness is about the decision-making process and people's biases in making decisions. One organisation I did some work for were trying to shoehorn in a technology which was not the right one to solve the problem. But it turned out that the IT team had been taken out uh, to dinner by the salespeople and lo and behold they had chosen this technology and it wasn't a good fit. And that really was difficult because it meant that the developers try, had to try and shoehorn this technology to meet requirements. So nothing to do with the technology. The technology was fine. It was just a bit like having a hammer when what they needed was a, a nail or an anvil. So people talk a lot about the opportunities in these systems as well. What I find is that the concepts and the code can be really obscure for a lot of people. It means it can be quite difficult to understand. So at the moment, I'm just going to try and give you some context. The thing is, if people don't understand concepts or code, then they don't trust them. And that ultimately impacts user adoption throughout the organisation. And that has to be managed very carefully, because if the users are not going to adopt a system, then the project is a failure before it started. I used to work for one major consultancy in the UK, worked for a few. But um, one project that I was working alongside was a project involving a major and very complex ETL system. I won't say which one it is. The technology itself works really fine. But what we found was the project had ran for two years, worked really well, but the users didn't adopt it. It basically gone on too long. The waterfall requirements had been written two or three years ago, no longer fitted the business, so the whole thing was a giant elephant. So nothing wrong with the technology, but it is all about the user adoption. So that can be impacted by people. It can also be impacted by what we might call shadow data in the organisation. With shadow data, I'm really thinking about those little Google Sheets, Excel workbooks, CSVs floating around an organisation in people's emails. You will find it really hard to get people out of Excel and Google Sheets. I just use those technologies as an example. In fact, um, I'd go far as far as saying they're almost like crack cocaine for a lot of business users. You will never get them to prize with their spreadsheets. And what they really want is a data source that they can analyse and they can access everything, all the data, because they find it hard to ask for what they want. So they want everything. And they want everything in a familiar format that's easy to understand. And if that means trying to squeeze five years worth of data over 200 columns into an Excel spreadsheet, that's what they're going to do. So the problem is about the lack of uh, support that we might see for these systems. That's really a threat, I think, is people not considering what the users are actually doing and not bringing the technology to enable them. And that obviously also impacts things like security as well. I hope that gives you some context about why the buzzwords are important. People like having the data in little data puddles all around the organisation and they get very excited about buying new technology, but they don't like change and they don't like to be changed. So there's all sorts of issues when we start to go down the route of building a data strategy. We have to understand where people are. But then if people are really not understanding the buzzwords or they're getting their understanding twisted by some of the vendors, it becomes more difficult to make a decision. Let's have a look at um, something a bit more vendor agnostic. I want to talk a bit about trends in the, organ in the, business, in the industry. So let's have a look at some of the keywords. What are people actually Googling for? and how popular are things. What I did was um, I jumped onto Google Keywords and I thought all we hear about is AI. We just hear about artificial intelligence all the time. And if you are closely associated with one of the vendors who is pushing AI, 
is a search term, then you're going to continually hear all about AI. But what are people actually looking for? And this really interests me, because it actually turned out the AI is, as a search term is actually search for less than machine learning. So when we start to think, if we use this um, as a measure of popularity, we can see that actually when we start to think about what the vendors are doing, just because they're making a lot of noise doesn't necessarily mean that that's the problem that people are trying to solve. Another um, term I hear a lot is deep learning. I'm going to explain what these terms are. Basically, everybody thinks they're the same thing, they're not. But when we look at the search terms here, we can see a very consistent pattern emerging all the time, with machine learning being at the top, deep learning not even half as many times searched for as that. So I thought I'll throw in data lake just for good measure. What does that look like? And then I thought data lake house, um, that's the new thing. Uh, we keep hearing about that and we need to find that too. So these um, sorts of things, you start to think, okay, how popular are these? Um, or is it just simply a matter of marketing noise versus what people, what problems people are trying to solve? So then this is quite interesting. So it's just a way of looking at things. So I did the same thing, actually, and I did in business intelligence this time. Um, and what we see, interestingly enough, is that business intelligence is, uh, comes up very highly in terms of the Google keyword searches. It comes up more than the data lake house and comes up more than the data warehouse as well. And data warehouse, again, is even more than the data lake house and the data lake. So and both of those combined. So we can start to see a few patterns emerging quite organically about what people are actually looking for out in the wild. And I'd bet that people are a bit confused about what it is they are trying to look at. I want to talk a little bit about probably one of the most interesting areas called deep learning. I want to define this first. And the reason for that is I see a lot of people talking about AI and what they actually mean is deep learning. Deep learning is a uh, a situation where we have lots of very complex algorithms. They're inspired by human biology, by the human brain. And basically, if you can imagine lots of neural networks strung together to build a really complex chain of neural networks, all interconnected, that's what deep learning looks like. Now, a reason I mention this one is because we see people talk about AI and AI being used to analyze videos and that kind of thing. It's probably not AI, it's probably deep learning, which is a subset of AI. It's very specifically designed um, to be very good at handling exceptions. And that's why it's so good at doing things like um, uh, working with a uh, video and image classification. And I've given you this example here, DeepMind, their uh, algorithms were used to actually control the temperature and things like Google data centers. And using deep learning, what they did was they reduced the amount of energy by up to 40%. So it's a big step forward using this technology as a big environmental impact. You may hear it as people talking about using AI, but it's actually using quite extensive um, neural networks hung together. Neural networks, just to define that, are basically mathematical expressions where we have an input and we have an output. And how you go from the input to the output is the bit in between that is called the middle layer. And the neural network is a very high level. It's got an input, an output, and the middle layer. And it's the middle layer that actually says, how do we get from the input to the output? If you're interested, you can actually have a look at some of the neural networks that are available using Microsoft Excel. If you are using the Microsoft Excel Solver add-in, it actually has neural networks under the hood. And um, so if you're interested, you can go off and have a look at that. And all that is, is it's trying to predict an output given an input using lots of layers. Now you can configure the neural network so it can do something called back propagation. And what that means is the outputs can then feed back through the middle layer to the input and then that serves as a way of reinforcing the message that's just been given. So there's um, quite a lot with it of deep learning being used in things like image classification and used in things like the environment as well. What's next for deep learning? Now, as the price of storage goes down, 
and the price of computation starts to go down, you'll probably see algorithms becoming increasingly complex. Now, the issue with that, that um, these algorithms will increasingly be used in order to make decisions about you. It, you know, so probably AI has been used right now to make decisions about you, and that can be things like, should you get a credit card or not? And should you be allowed to get a mortgage or not, that kind of thing. So the concern with that is, is about the ethical side of things and, and explainability. How do you explain what the algorithm is doing? And how, who's responsible for that algorithm as well? You could be responsible, but not accountable. So that's another area that's of concern. And maybe if, a, if you like, I can come back and talk about ethics another day. I think it's really interesting. And it needs a whole topic in its own. It's not something we can shortcut. So I just thought I'll put in a few examples where deep learning, in particular, is an area that is in the news, although you may see it called AI. The reason uh, that is, I think AI is much more hashtagable. Even though we know from our Google keywords, people are actually searching for machine learning more frequently. So there's a few um, few um, features here for deep learning that's been used. So the race is on to build self-driving cars. Why? It's not just about the self-driving car. It's about the data about you when you are in the self-driving car. If you can imagine a taxi, a little pod is taking you from location A to location B, and it's driving you. You could be bombarded with adverts, while you're on your way in the journey, so that those adverts could be tailored to you specifically because they know who you are, they've got your credit card and your details and your email address. So they could tag adverts and you would be sitting watching the adverts while you're in the pod that's driving you from A to B. So some ways it's not the car itself that's important. In other ways, it's actually the data that you generate that's used for you and against you in order to sell your products. So we've also got uh, another example of a chip here. Uh, this is IBM True North. It's uh, delivered uh, on a synapse metric of a 1 million neuron brain inspired processor. So there's some real advances in technology here, uh, particularly by IBM. It's, you might think it takes a lot of energy. It actually consumes only 70 milliwatts. It's capable of 46 billion synaptic operations per second per watt. So particularly, is really small and it is a real supercomputer in your palm. The reason I mention this one is because I think sometimes we talk a lot about speed when we talk about data systems, but I think you can get very hung up in what the vendors see, how quickly they are processing data or how quickly they're writing and reading data. But actually, yeah, when we look at something like this, it's almost a piece of art because it's so fast at landing the data and doing things with it. Another area is healthcare. So if you can analyze electronic healthcare records, what some researchers found at Sutter Health and the Georgia Institute of Technology, they could predict heart failure as much as nine months before it actually happened, just as well as doctors using traditional means. And they used uh, deep learning in order to do that. They used um, NVIDIA technology, in case you're interested. So there's lots of different ways we see this technology could be used, but it does have industry-wide uh, implications as well. Uh, we are thinking of human task automation. So IoT, for example, can release lots of data. It can give you, basically, I've been involved in some IoT projects, and you really get some really interesting things from the data, and the data is coming at you really fast. But it's more than just looking at human task automation. We're also looking at what data to analyze. We're leaving a data breadcrumb trail as we move throughout the world, and the sensors can be picking up this as well. So with Internet of Things, um, you see more, uh, thinking about trends, you see more and more interactions happening between different IoT systems. In some ways, I'm not sure I like the term IoT. Sometimes you might hear IIoT, which is the industry Internet of Things. I prefer the network of things. I'm not sure I like it being so industry specific. And the network of things is basically IoT coming together across different data sources being deployed, different networks, and giving you what you're looking for at that time, or being helped to be used in some data analysis some way. And I think that's why the current wireless technology, particularly around 5G, is becoming so interesting, because that's really enabling some of this 
pulling together of IoT into a network of things. And that's going to produce lots of data streams and analytics. They're really important for collecting the information that we need, say, for example, for smart cities. So well, how do we embrace IoT? Now, it's not an end in itself. It's really as part of a digital maturity programme, really trying to make the business and organisation sustainable in terms of growth and success. In its own context, the data on its own doesn't tell us very much. And that's why we try and put the data with other things. So it gives us a much bigger story. And we can get really creative as well. Telling uh, data storytelling, I think, will take a whole new meaning because it will be about telling stories of the data from lots of different sources, not just dashboards and reports. AI, ML, ENN, DL, what is going on? You know, so many terms here. We've mentioned, um, we've summarised a few terms so far. So we looked at deep learning, we talked about value, and we talked about neural networks. So I want to talk a little bit about AI. This is one of the most confusing terms, I think, for people to understand what it means. Now you get what's known as AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And that's much more with, aligned with the sort of thing that you might see in a Hollywood movie. So Terminator, if you're old enough to remember that, the first time round, uh, they probably made more iterations then. But Terminator was all about Arnie coming down and uh, being this robot that was going to attack people. And then as the series continued, and they became the good guy and then the guy from the next files became the bad robots and everybody started to get excited about the power of AI and that's what people think about. So that's an artificial general intelligence. You may think of it in terms of a uh, Steve Wozniak's um, coffee test. The coffee test is about testing a system called an AI. For example, confusingly, an AI could just be a robot that's going to take um, your instruction to make you a cup of coffee in your own home and it's going to go and make you that coffee and do it correctly without being told. Now you might think well making a coffee is really easy right? Well it might be really easy and um, for us as humans unless you of course are my 16 year old son he, he doesn't seem to be able to <laughs> make a coffee for me but I do a loved one. So it really means involving things like how do you make um, Where's the water? Where's the kitchen? Where's everything in the house uh, to make the coffee? Uh, getting the ingredients right in the right order and making your coffee exactly how you like it. So that's the Steve Wozniak coffee test. And it's more about a test of what does an, an artificial general intelligence actually look like? And it uses context. So we also get artificial narrow intelligence. And what artificial inter uh, narrow intelligence really means is that you have the ability to train artificial intelligence to be very good at one thing. That really means that we have that in our phones, you might have Alexa or Siri or something like that. We've got artificial intelligence very good at uh, one thing and one thing only. You also get the singularity as well. Now, we talk about the singularity in terms of AI, and that's a bit more the way that you might see something like um, Skynet, for example. It, it means different things depending on your background. So for example, if your background is actually in astrophysics, it's going to be a point at time in which some property somewhere is infinite. For example, at the center of a black hole, and um, the density is infinite at that point because a finite mass is compressed to zero, and that would simply be called a singularity at that point. Now, that's not to be confused with Microsoft's definition of singularity. Uh, you may have seen in the past few days that Microsoft have um, released in an AI infrastructure service, which is all about trying to make AI infrastructure and more cost effective. It's currently codenamed Singularity, but that's actually, um, when I think about Singularity as an AI person, um, I'm thinking of a technological singularity, which is a point in the future at which technological growth is totally uncontrolled. It's also irreversible, and it's going to result in, in unforeseeable changes to the human race. So you, there's different versions of this, but one is called intelligence explosion, where uh, an intelligent agent, a robot of some description, will enter a runaway reaction of self-improvement cycles. Each one of those will become 
increasingly rapid and optimizing, causing an explosion in intelligence. And it really is all about a powerful superintelligence that is much more superior to human intelligence. I was quite disappointed actually that Microsoft have used this singularity term to mean that AI infrastructure service, because the singularity, the technological singularity in terms of AI is something quite different. Uh, the real definition of singularity is something that was actually been around since 1993. It was actually appeared first in an essay by a gentleman called Werner Wenger. And I apologize if you see his name wrong. And Wenger wrote that the singularity the irreversible technological advancement would signal the end of the human race. The superintelligence would continue to upgrade and upgrade, and we would never be able to understand the rate it would work at. Public figures, say for example Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, have expressed concerns in a series of letters when they Professor Hawking was alive that AI could actually end in the result of um, making humans ext extinct, and people have debated the singularity back and forth. So I have no idea why Microsoft have called the latest AI service, the singularity. I'm hoping they will change that because uh, I can't think of uh, anything more misguided actually in terms of a, a naming. So if Microsoft, if you're listening, please make it stop. Uh, don't call it that because it's completely uh, incorrect. So we've got AI as an, an artificial general intelligence, an artificial narrow intelligence, and an artificial super intelligence, also known as a singularity, not Microsoft's Azure service, but the technological singularity as defined and been around now and defined for the past 30 years. Someone asked me the other day, what is an AI model? And then I sort of explained a little bit that an AI model is a tool or an algorithm. It's a pattern that fits onto data. And then they said something really insightful. What's the difference between that and a data model then? And I thought that's really interesting because we talk about AI models, we talk about data models, and I hadn't seen before how someone could really confuse the two. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about AI models. So an AI model is going to ingest a data set and search through that data set for patterns. And just going to use those patterns to try to make a decision, reach a conclusion, or make a prediction, usually automatically. And it does that without any interference in the decision making process by humans. So that's for me, I think, really interesting because the data model would be the part where the data set is um, fitting a particular lens or a structure. So very important, don't confuse the data model and an AI model. The AI model is going to use a data set. The data set are the source or sources of data are going to be structured in a certain way. And that's what a data model is going to do. The data model is going to be the pattern of the data. The AI model is going to be the patterns made from the data. So that just a really insightful question that someone asked me actually quite recently. And I thought that's actually a very, very good point. I can see the confusion there. We talk about the last mile problem in analytics. And the last mile problem of analytics is how do you derive value from it? And normally we think about that in terms of making it go to production. So the last mile problem of AI is actually a bit different. In some ways, the last mile problem of AI is about taking AI and putting it into production. And in some ways, it's a first mile problem of AI. And what that really means in the last mile of AI it's producing that automated model that's in production, it's deployed, it's running, and it's actually actively producing decisions based on data it's never seen before. I have worked with customers where I've deployed AI models into production. I've said to them, and given them a process for keeping those up to date. I've gone off site and they have done other things, anything except optimizing and looking after the AI model. People seem to think it just looks after itself. Well, not yet, honey, maybe in the future. But right now, what we're trying to do is get AI models so that they are working well. They're not overfitting the data and so they're not um, making bad predictions either. We're trying to find that sweet spot. So I just thought sometimes you might hear the last mile problem in analytics different from the last mile problem in AI because the last mile problem of analytics is where you're not expecting it to make decisions. You're expecting to derive insights and actions from it. So I just thought it's worth about spending a little bit of time explaining what a pattern actually is. I just mentioned AI models, we're looking for patterns. 
Now, uh, this uh, gentleman, Satoshi Watanabe, defined a pattern as the opposite of chaos. It's a, a thing that you're looking for, an entity that could be given a name. It's a thing of interest that you want to identify. So let's say you are doing image classification. You're trying to identify things in the image. And that thing is an entity, an item of interest, and you're trying to understand it. Basically, you're trying to label it. So when you look at AI systems, you might see the word label coming up. And basically, that's you using a pattern to identify a thing as being a particular, having a particular label or of being a member of a particular entity. We talk a lot about patterns. We're trying to understand how, what the formula is it where within that algorithm could be used in order to make predictions. But we need to think about the output as well. What is it giving us? It's basically helping us to work out what the label actually is. So with that in mind, I thought it's probably worthwhile looking at the ugly duckly theory. So Watanabe gave an example. And what this is trying to show is that any two entities can be similar or dissimilar on a quite arbitrary basis by changing the criterion of what actually counts as a relevant attribute. What we see here is that if we are classifying these, you probably put A and B as the same, and we'd probably think that C, the poor ugly duckling, I know how it feels, sweetie, really, uh, to be the ugly duckling. So this would be me here, and this would be um, everyone else over here. Using objects A, B, and C, A being this one here, B being this one here, C being this one here, we have two properties of the ugly, ugly duckling. First, which is denoted by F, and W, which is denoted by white. And then we've got a series of sim uh, symbols here. So some do, uh, denote false, true, not, and, and an exclusive, or also as well. So since F happens to imply W, each of these predicates that can be formed from F and W, they coincide with one another. So we end up with eight possible eight possibilities here, and they're each shown in their own line. So we can see that the white ducklings here, A and B, actually agree in four of these lines. So they agree on two, they agree on three, because they're both knots here. They agree in four, because they're both knots. And they also agree in number eight as well, because they both uh, agree, they're both positive for that one. But what we do find is that A and C also agree in four lines as well. They agree on number three, because they're both knots here. They agree in number five. Uh, so they agree in the five. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Sorry, five. We've got a zero here and a zero here. They also agree in line seven. We've got a one here and a one here. And they also agree in line number eight, both positive. And same for B and C as well. You can see that they match on line one, line three, line six, and then line eight. So when we're looking at AI systems, we can run into this ugly duckling problem where we're not really sure which attributes should be used in order to identify or label something appropriately. And we try to get around this problem by adding in constraints to say, well, if we don't have this, then we don't have that. But it turns into a wider problem. And I think this is one of the reasons the AI models are so difficult to explain in terms of what they're doing and how they're behaving because it's easy to find positive characteristics, but not quite so easy to find um, negative characteristics that go together. So I thought this would be quite interesting to, to explain some of the actual problems that we're dealing with when we do with AI systems and why it's difficult to explain. So when we look at AI models, we are also trying to demystify some of these as well. So we are thinking about AI and machine learning. Now you remember earlier in the session, I explained that um, machine learning is actually searched for much more frequently than AI is, according to Google. Personally, I'm surprised by that, maybe because I've been skewed by some marketing somewhere, but that's what we find. Now, they're both part of computer science, and they both help to contribute to create intelligent systems. The difference is that AI is inspired by human thinking, but machine learning is not. Machine learning is all about reducing a search space to make a prediction or come to a conclusion. It's not necessarily trying to be inspired by human thinking, and it's not necessarily trying to replicate any sort of human behavior anywhere. 
the AI is inspired by human thinking, even if it's not dealing with a cognitive aspect of human thinking, it's maybe inspired by the way that we are solving problems in some way. So that's really the difference between the two. Machine learning is much more about stats. AI has got that element and that component in it where it's inspired by human thinking. Now, deep learning is inspired a bit further by human biology. It's inspired by our biology as well as the ways in which we think, even more difficult to explain. So just to demystify those terms, there's almost a continuum in terms of how they solve problems, and that's how we think about them. Data science versus data analytics. Now, again, two terms that are really confusing. So data science is a broad field. It's really got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's all about trying to produce and predict outcomes somewhere. It also involves concepts such as data engineering, which is we were trying to take data in, clean it, and do something with that data, and then use it in order to get some insight somewhere. It can be confused by data analytics, and that's more focused on the start process. It's more thinking about investigating data sets to identify and understand trends and patterns in that data. We just mentioned patterns um, a moment ago. That gives us insights into the data, helps us to make better decisions. Analytics is more narrow, and it's all about data science. Um, as data science is more about the processes for data modeling and production. People often ask which data science model should they use. Um, it's only part of the process, it's much broader than that. But analytics is all about the outcomes. What do you get from it? Analytics is about insights. Data science is broader than that, it's thinking all about making discoveries on large sets of data and it's just that broader definition. So we mentioned deep learning earlier, uh, just a quick recap of that. Another term I wanted to address was ENNs. So I mentioned neural networks earlier. Artificial neural, neural networks, you can see here, it's just the same thing. So you might see that acronym ENN appear somewhere. Um, deep learning is a complex network, stringing lots of neural networks together and we use it for all sorts of things. Just a quick brief overview. We might use it for Google Photos, for example. So if you are looking at things at like Google Images, that will use deep learning uh, to recognize. It's also very good for recognizing images, faces, that kind of thing. So we talk about facial recognition. Uh, facial recognition is not new. Uh, we were looking at that at university uh, in the 90s. It was a while ago. So that's been around for a long time. What's different now is the technology is cheaper. So you'll probably see more of that starting to happen. But then when we look at images, what we're trying to do is break those images down. Uh, so we feed an image into a neural network when it's doing image recognition. And, and the neural network is, go is going to accept that data. It will accept it as numbers. And the images are actually just seen as a grid of numbers. The higher the number, the greater the intensity. So it's almost like a, a, a matrix. Uh, so here we see we've got a grid on the left hand side and the right hand side we see the grid overlay with numbers and then what we see is that uh, we feed the numbers the image into the neural network and we're just looking at it as if it was an array of 25 numbers as we have got here so what we've got there is we've got our input which is a representation of our image and then what we're trying to do is identify and find that label of what we're trying to see in the image. Now, there's a whole science about this. We spend all night just talking about this. But, um, yeah, we won't say uh, I'm conscious of time. So we, have a, we do a mapping between the input and the output. So this is the point at which the neural network is doing its magic. It's the maths. It's taking the input, working out the output. And often what you can do is um, you can feed back from the output back to the input and try and optimize what this uh, looks like. They do go through quite a lot of training iterations. There's a lot of interesting work going on at the moment where organizations are trying to look at ways that they can start to make uh, the data sets for research much smaller. Uh, so I think you'll probably see more of that happening in the future. We also know that contextually, pictures of a story or a structure, unless of course it's Salvador Dali, who produced quite a lot of incongruous pictures. This was on my wall at university when I uh, was in student digs. So uh, I like this one. Deep learning is very good for image recognition because it's got a concept called translation invariance. 
So the number three is the number three, no matter where it shows up in the picture. So he uses a variance to help identify what's happening there. Also think about convolution as well. That's where images, you can break them down into tiles. Uh, the network is going to identify each of those tiles for the objects. And it's just going to look at the most interesting parts of the file or the picture. And it does that to try and compress the file size and just give reducing the amount of data that it's traversing in order to get to a result. So you might use that for things like x-rays. And um, if an x-ray shows nothing on it, then it's going to skip all of that. But if you feed in tons of x-rays, some of them will have uh, darker patches than others, for example, if it's found something, and that's when it's, got, it's going to zone in on. So I just want to mention a few other terms as well. We've got the data layer, lake house. You might hear this a lot. I hear people talk about it and what they tend to say is you don't like the term because you don't understand it. And it's a bit arrogant, I think. So I think we need to take a step back and, you know, people laugh at this term and then other people say you're just laughing, you just don't understand it. So let's take the sting out of it a bit. It's an open design system. It's implementing similar data structures and data management features that's quite similar to a data warehouse. They tend to operate in low-cost storage. But what we're doing is, is merging them together into a single system. And the idea is that you've got data teams can uh, become more agile. They can use that data without needing to access many systems all at once. It's trying to give you the most up-to-date data available. So it's part of a wider chain used for data science, machine learning, and data analytics projects. Now, the difference between this and the data warehouse is it's got metadata layers for data lakes. And it can also have very fast query engines. So it's giving you the SQL language very quickly in data lakes. If you've ever used Apache Hive, you will know that it's very, very lengthy in terms of how it they crunches through those queries. So people are trying to find different ways around that. If you're using an um, open source methodology like the Delta Lake, we've got the metadata layers there. They're sitting on top of open file formats such as Parquet, and they're going to follow and track which files are part of different versions of the table. And that's going to try and give you acid compliant transactions on those systems. So it's going to support things like streaming the I.O. And it's going to be able to move back and forward, a bit like Doctor Who and the TARDIS, to all the versions of the table. It can also validate data and use um, schema enforcement as well. One popular thing about it is the performance and the fact it's using low-cost object stores. So it's going to cache the hot, hot data in RAM or SSDs, and then it's going to work that way, um, swapping the data in and out. So because it's using things like Parquet, data scientists like it, machine learning uh, engineers also like it as well. And it can also work with um, open source um, technology such as Pandas. You can use it with Google's TensorFlow, PyTorch, that kind of thing, as long as you can um, access Parquet files and do our seeds as well. You could also use things like Spark Data Frames on it as well. And that's really good when we think about reproducibility and machine learning. We want to be able to reproduce our results. So that's, again, coming back to that last mile problem, which is often the first mile problem. How do we reproduce what we have already? And um, data warehousing, I mentioned briefly, um, very common, been around for a very, very long time. You can see here data sources, lift and shifting data using its track transforming loads, landing that data into the data warehouse. So that is often not regarded as a very flexible way. It's a nightmare sometimes to update ETL packages. Uh, Mark and I can probably tell you some stories about that. But so the data vault methodology has come along and it's become increasingly popular. And um, it's really built around three main pillars, architecture, model and methodology. And this is absolutely directed at solving business problems. And it's very good at keeping up with business requirements, which, as we know, change a lot. So it's really a methodology, and it's all about trustworthiness of the data, consistency, repeatability, and being very, very business focused. It's very much emphasizing things like collaboration with the business and meeting standards as well. It's really great and very prescriptive in terms of the implementation. So there's rules, best practices, the standards, and all sorts of designs. So if you um, head over to Jan Lindstead's site, I suggest you do that. So I really recommend you do. Uh, you'll find lots of great information there and absolute wealth of information. So strongly recommended. 
So the data mesh, um, what that's the data mesh is trying to do is make data available and accessible at scale. It's allowing business users and data scientists to access the data. So it's not just the remit of the data scientist and it's not jamming data into an Excel spreadsheet. So it's not just aimed only at business users. And what it's trying to do is provide faster access to query the data. It's then faster time to return results back to people and we're not having to transport the data anywhere. So the uh, data mesh is all about that. And we've got the data fabric. So the data fabric is really about a unified data fabric for all forms of data consumption. It's an architecture and it's more about data services producing data products. It's providing you a capability service and it gives you that across a variety of endpoints. It's also good for putting data together that's on premise and also part of multiple cloud and on premise environments as well. It's basically stitching together historical and current data and it's more about the integration side of things. So normally you see this appearing when people talk about digital transformation because people assume the architecture will reduce costs in some way. So sometimes the data fabric is really thinking about the integration part, putting the integrable data structures together, uh, rather than looking at it and trying to pull all the data into one place, like data lake. It's trying to break the data and down into reusable components. So it's trying to do that. So I'll just get a few more slides and I promise I will finish. So the data fabric is trying to solve a problem. So when uh, we look at business data, the problem is that the data often disappears. Uh, people don't know where the data has gone. Uh, the problem of disappearing data gets worse over time. And it really means that the value isn't derived from the data. The data fabric is handling enormous amounts of data from a variety of sources. It's not replicating all the data into yet another place. And it does this through data integration, data virtualization, and using uh, good data management technologies as well. It's all about semantic layer. So you can sometimes come across using the data fabric and the data vaults together. They're both very aimed at meeting what the business needs. And they're obviously very good at solving irregularly shaped data sets. That's where the data warehouse falls down in some ways because it has to be very regularly shaped. So the data vault is much wider in terms of focus and coverage. So the data fabric itself can be a part of that overall architecture. It supports the integration aspects of data vault methodology. And the data fabric itself emphasizes data ingestion and integration, basically the fabric of how the data connect. The methodology of the data vault is very concerned with business as well, but it's all about solving business problems to give you that value from the data, not only just data ingestion and integration, it's also focusing on data methodologies and uh, governance as well. So I promise that this is the last slide and I'm sorry we ran over. Putting lipstick on a pig, okay? I have ended with this slide. Because sometimes you have to be really careful about the vendors are telling you. They will sell you their vision and their definition. They will try to push you their licenses and their software and their support. And sometimes if you ask the same vendor the same question at different points of time, you will get a different answer dependent on what they're pushing at that time. And I think that's what's so dangerous about these buzzwords. It's something that I personally don't like. So the purpose of this session is try to give a more independent and neutral um, assessment of what these terms actually are. So next time you see them, you can ask yourself a good questions and ask your vendors really good questions about what they actually mean with a good hearty dollop of cynicism of what it is they're trying to sell you. Because um, the anyway with my charming cynicism and clear sight, I will hand back to Mecca and Marco. And thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming up, and I'm thinking we'll dig into the first one uh, right away. When a customer comes to you and wants to use random buzzword, how hard is it to change the customer to accept usage of the technology they really need instead? Do you have any tips on convincing them? It's a great question, and it's actually really, really hard uh, because uh, what I have to do is display my extraordinary cynicism and ask what the vendors have been trying to sell them. And then I try and explain exactly to the customer, look, what do you actually need? I know you're going to be disappointed with a plain bread and butter type of answer, 
But you have to think about it in terms of the magpie approach. Now, I call it the shiny magpie syndrome. People like to buy shiny, really new technology all the time. But what I do tend to see is that um, when organisations buy the shiny stuff, they are not really thinking about how people are going to implement that. So I don't know if that helps any, but I just try and boil it back down again to what do you actually need? What's the priorities? Um, I find that a wonderful way of doing it is looking at the costs, right? So if I say, okay, here's option A, B, here's option A, here's option C. So I'm offering you, offering you option A as an architecture. Now, it might be more simple than what the vendor is offering you. And um, so I might say, look, here's a very simple architecture. Here's what you need. And it will serve what you want. And the cost is this. And then one customer, for example, that I worked with, they had basically every buzzword going in their architecture. What changed their minds was their cloud bill. I wouldn't see who the cloud vendor was, but they were horrified. And I said, I told you the costs. I told you you didn't need it. You proceeded anyway because you gave your IT team access to the portal. They went off and did things. I asked you uh, to think carefully before you proceeded. But now you're sitting looking at a bill for thousands and thousands of pounds. And I can only recommend uh, that you listen to your Auntie Jennifer next time. Your Auntie Jennifer told you to pause and consider the costs and you've proceeded without that. And that bill for that cloud vendor was wonderfully focusing in terms of people's minds back in the problem and what it was they were trying to do. So eventually they did listen to the Auntie Jennifer and the Auntie Jennifer um, managed to sort, sort them out. But, but still the stubborn customer always gets it wrong. Oh, they always get it wrong. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for that. If someone else goes in and, and mucks it up. And then I usually like to parachute it in when people are desperate. I've always been a bit of a canary in the cage type of problem solver. It's like, you know, get, you know, get her to do it. <laughs> hmm. um, and it's easy to blame the external consultant. And I usually go in when they are in a bad way. Right. Good stuff. Well, there you go, Mikkel. Costs and listen to Auntie Jennifer. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, I often struggle to understand the difference between BI and BA, so business intelligence and business analytics. How would you define each term? Yeah, I should have covered that, and I didn't. And I do apologise. I'll get stuck in other things. But business intelligence is, I see it as, a based on historical view of your data up to this point in time. It's not trying to do anything predictive, but business analytics is on occasion trying to do more predictive analytics. It's trying to look through the windscreen of the car rather than the rear view. So business intelligence is about the rear view of your business up to this point in time. Business analytics tends to be more about what's going to happen next. Making forecasts, for example, doing what if scenarios, trying to measure your success against the KPI, whether you will or not based on the data. So I see it in terms of where the data sits and what lens you're looking at. If it's behind you, historical, then it's BI. And I probably shouldn't say this, but many BI problems are actually solved by basic descriptive statistics. Min, max, average, count. Top this, top that. Right, so even thickos like me can do that then. Oh, Mark, you're not a thicko. <laughs> there was a, a slight tongue-in-cheek there, but... Uh... Let's face it, even I can do that. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, so that's, that's how it works. <laughs> So let's do a doomsday question. Mm -hmm. uh, when visionaries like yourself and, for instance, authors of Terminator and iRobot warn people about going too far, combining all AI machine learning into the singularity, mm -hmm. what do you think about the tech nerds that are actually inspired to create the things by listening to the warnings? Um, I think... Uh... We, we could cover that quite a bit. I think I think that there are active um, research projects in that at the moment. I don't get any evidence, but this is just an opinion uh, worth no more and no less than anyone else's. But I think that's probably happening at the moment. I think I see things like people getting the fridge to walk and autonomous cars. I think there would be a use for using those for defence and also for attack in the uh, war situations. A bit of me does think that People being people, 
they will never extract themselves from the Excel spreadsheets. So trying to get them to do AI when you will be clutching spreadsheets out of their cold, dead blue fingers is probably not going to happen for the vast majority of people. You'd have to have a lot of funding and you'd have to uh, have a multidisciplinary approach to it as well. So it's not just going to be um, technology, it'll be things like electronic engineering and contextual information as well. But we do see huge strides in uh, supercomputers like the IBM Tunoth that we mentioned earlier. And I remember back in the day, you know, trying to squeeze Word documents onto a floppy disk and, you know, getting it down to 1.4 meg <laughs> so that it fitted on the floppy disk. And that's how old I am. And when I think now of, you know, my son goes off to school, he's got a 32 gig hard drive swinging off his keychain with his stuff on it that he's been doing at home and he's taking a backup basically. And they just think that's just incredible. Young children now just don't know they're born. But we do have to think about the advances people are making all the time. So. Right. So um got a question from our good friend Dimitro Andrutenko. Have you seen any successful implementations of a lake house? The concept is great, but I feel the technology is not mature enough for implementation of any serious semantic complexity. No, I what I see is, is people asking about it. I don't see people trying to implement it. And I think the reason for that is uh, people have tried to do, say, big data projects a few years ago, and those haven't been successful. And they tend to have perhaps tried to implement CRM systems, and they haven't been successful. So they've got a list of IT failure after IT failure. I think sometimes I speak to some business leaders, some CTOs, and they're obviously just talking about things, but not seriously going to do it. They're going to leave that to the next CTO to do. But in the meantime, it's, they're going to look like they're doing something because they're talking about the leak house, right? And we all know that if we're talking about something, in some people's eyes, it's the same as actually doing something. So no, I don't. And I think uh, this is my natural, charming cynicism coming out again. I don't see many implementations of it uh, that are successful. I see people talking about it. And then moving on to the next big, shiny thing. Just to extend that question and um, slightly, do you think that's partially because, you know, even when you're talking about uh, presenting the late data in Databricks SQL or Synapse SQL or whatever you want to choose, um, there, there still needs to be some level of curation on that data in on on the lake? Could you, I mean, is that is that a fair comment or is there another obstacle? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, I don't know if you see this, Mark, but I see the costs putting people off, actually. So uh, say we take Synapse as an example. Um, a, we start to add in more functionality, more data, and the costs start to go up quite a bit. And it becomes really hard for an organisation to say, right, so we're going to spend £4,000 a month, for example, on Synapse. What are we going to get back for that? And that's when the accountants start to come in. They start to say, well, you're asking for a big spend here. Can you justify that? And that becomes really hard. And um, I try and justify it in terms of productivity uh, and try to see whether well, that's going to save you time or you're going to perhaps maybe try it as a proof of concept for a little while and see how it runs. So you're not, you, you're not asking for a big commit. You're asking for something just to see what people get from, from it as a research project and then take it back down again. Because I think people learn through failing at things. I know I certainly do. Uh, to see if that's what they really, really want. But I think when it comes to signing off the spend, uh, they don't tend to do it, and that's why. But I do like the idea of creation because oh, I, I'm dealing with uh, one organisation I've been dealing with for a little while, and I delivered a project using the Dataverse, and yeah, using Dynamics. And what I found was it's almost too easy to shovel data around and have it in all sorts of different places all over the place. Now, what happens is Azure, the cloud, is supposed to rise up to meet that. So regardless of where your data is, it's going to give you the performance boost to return that data quickly. Now, that sounds great, apart from when you go to build a Power BI report, and you think, right, so where's that column coming from? Is it here in this table, or is it over there in that table, or is it over there in that table? And I think people don't really understand always the consequences of putting the data here, there, and everywhere when they start to amend very flexible tools. And that's just with the Dataverse and Dynamics. I think if you're letting people loose on a leak house, you're going to end up with the same thing. People are not going to know where stuff is. And people don't want to do the basic stuff. 
with the data. I don't know if you see this, Mark, but I see very few organisations with a successful data dictionary and a successful data lake. I think I've seen about three data dictionaries in my entire life. And they say, well, why don't we document what the data actually means? You know, let's do a database diagram in Visio. And then it's like, I've just, it, as if I've thrown a grenade into the meeting <laughs> and everybody just looks at one another like, yeah, that's a good idea. And what they really mean is you're our auntie Jennifer, you can do that. I had a junior uh, data scientist work for me for three months on a project she was seconded to me for, a, uh, I was an interim technical lead for a customer and they gave me this new data scientist. And um, I said to her, okay, we're going to create a data dictionary for the next three months. And I think, honestly, if she could have reached across the table and punched me out, I think she would have uh, really done that because she must have thought, well, I'm going to do data science for writing Python. I'm going to be using all this great stuff. And then I said, data dictionary, you're sitting in itself for three months writing that. And I, by the end of the three months, she said, I actually did hate you for that for the first six weeks. But by the end of it, she saw the value of it. And she was so incredibly useful to the organisation because she was the only one who knew anything about the data. And it was a great way to embed her in the organisation because she had to go and bounce herself off different people in the organisation to get what she was looking for. And she became like a detective. And you know what? She's doing really well now in that organisation. She understood the power of being useful by doing the stuff that people don't want to do. And that's a big lesson for Monty Jennifer. Be useful, be relevant. Cool. Isn't that the base of all our analytics things? Know your data before you start or get to know the data? Um, I try and do a bit of both. I, I try and ask people, what metric, what one thing do you want to see in the dashboard? And they say, I want to see, I don't know, a particular metric. Right, how are we going to calculate that? And then they look at me because they kind of know what they want to see. And then we have to feed back. So I think it's a bit of a cycle. You ask them what they want. You go off, you look for it, and when you're along that journey, you're documenting the data dictionary as you go. It's not about documentation for documentation's sake. I'd say it's probably more a symptom of a lack of process, and I think if the process is in, is in place, the data dictionary is a good output of that. Um, so I worked for one organisation where they swore blind, they had no Excel spreadsheets. I said, you must have shadow data, right? So no, 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 no. Not as everything is just IT, robust data assets, everything's under the guardianship of IT. And then I met the business analyst and she said, oh, I've got a spreadsheet to show you. And I said, I thought you didn't have any. And she said, Oh yeah, I don't tell them that. And it turns out that she had a spreadsheet of her spreadsheets. She has so many spreadsheets. She had to have another spreadsheet to manage them. And she had on the first page of this itself spreadsheet 45 key crucial little data, data sources. So sometimes the little data is just as important as the big data sources because the business is running in those. Well, that was actually the last of our questions. And I would say thanks to everybody for joining us and a big thank you to Jen. It's been lovely to speak to you both and thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to seeing you soon.